Good afternoon. Hi, Dr. Paula. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Russell. Uh, I do work as a filmmaker. I'm also the founder of Create 2030, which is about engaging artists and creatives and storytellers in support of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We are an artist-led network, and we are made up of 20%, I'm sorry, 90%, BIPOC artists, artists of color, and we do everything from performances to workshops to really advocating for responsible engagement of artists and creatives in the sustainability space. So I'm going to start off by just showing you a quick video before I jump into a conversation with Dr. Paula, who is calling us in from Kenya. So if you can roll my video, please. Somewhere close, a woman's hands are shaking like a tantrum under California's feet. I can feel the sea level beneath her eyes rising like temperature. This warm body of water sitting on the edge of her sight still as the calm after a flood falls like an empire. Tears running down her cheek like wildlife out of a burning habitat, her lungs, two volcanoes sleeping under a blanket of smoke, screaming in a voice made of ashes hot enough to peel the skin off the sky, fingers running through her scalp like chainsaws through a forest, she stretched out. Gray as a rain cloud in a hurricane, there's a landfill-sized hole buried in the layers of her heart. smell the methane walking out of her pores like an alcoholic walks into the living room body covered in bruises only a man made she cries every day and if you ask her how to make her stop she'll tell you ride a bike with Hold my hand, put the lights off, pick those poems up off the floor, don't throw them away, finish them. Use them over and over and over and stop moving so fast, they're gonna miss everything I made for us. Don't take me for granted. Treat me like you would treat your mother. Like I'm the only one you'll ever have. Okay, thank you so much. So Dr. Paul and I had a chance to talk briefly before uh, we started this session, and the title of this panel is uh, Storytelling for Sustainable Impact. Um, but I think everybody, if you're at this conference here right now, we all appreciate the power of storytelling for sustainable development. Am I right? Yeah? So we decided we're going to play with the title a little bit, where we're going to instead talk about sustainable environments for impact storytellers. So I think we have a mutual agreement um, in wanting to talk about decolonizing arts and storytelling in the sustainability space and sort of um, talk a little bit about the ethics and, and the struggles and the challenges and the resilience I think we've both had in this space. So Dr. Paula, I will turn it over to you. I think we've both had non-conventional journeys to becoming storytellers and filmmakers. Neither of us went to film school, but if you want to just introduce yourself and maybe a little bit about your journey into storytelling, um, it's a fascinating story, so take it away. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you uh, everyone for this opportunity. I am an ecologist. I studied um, ecology at Princeton University because I am fascinated with nature. I adore Africa's wildlife and I studied elephants, one of my favorite animals in the world. And completing my PhD at Princeton 
working for the Kenya government for several years led me to conclude that there is a fundamental problem that we have in Africa, and that is that Africans generally um, are not really encouraged to go into conservation or even research about our natural environment, particularly our majestic wildlife species. Africa, at the same time, is this continent, the second largest continent in the world with this vast array of megafauna, the elephants, rhinos, giraffes, and these, these uh, animals which have disappeared from many other continents. And so the absence of African experts working in this field, but also the presence, maybe the dominating presence of scientists, conservation heroes, narrators, presenters, hosts of all the television programs around the world is largely people from the global north, uh, America, Europe, and that kind of thing. And it actually has caused a uh, almost like a psychological challenge in Africa that when I started studying elephants, I was questioned, am I trying to be a white person? Because I'm trying to go into a field that is dominated by white people. What was I saying about myself? And am I, am I abandoning the uh, desire of most Africans, which is to become developed, civilized, uh, you know, living in these big cities? And, and, and so it's always been a big challenge. And I, and I went into conservation, I worked in policy, I've worked for the private sector and I've st I'm now working for a conservation organization. And I've moved into storytelling and filmmaking because the storytelling we know is a very powerful medium to change hearts and minds. And that is actually the basis of the environmental movement worldwide is documentaries made, many of them actually in Africa. In fact, Bristol, which is now considered the Hollywood of, wild, of uh, nature documentaries, um, is, is grounded on documentaries made in Africa. This is a, a part of the world where hundreds of filmmakers are making a very good living out of making films in other parts of the world. Yet here in Africa, and can I show the first slide please? Here in Africa, we actually uh, have a dearth of scientists working on these majestic species that we have, but we also have a near complete absence of storytellers telling the stories of our nature and our wildlife. And as a result, the whole world hears about these amazing animals and these creatures uh, from voices that are Western voices looking into Africa. It's, it's not our story. Our stories have never been told. Until Wildlife Direct started making wildlife documentaries, uh, nobody had heard the stories of our local conservation heroes, the people at the front line, people who are risking their lives to save these majestic animals, not just for Kenya or for Africa, but for the world, because these are global heritage. And so I started making a TV series called Wildlife Warriors. I didn't go to film school. The reason why I had to make these films is because I saw the public needed knowledge and information. We needed inspiration. We needed reasons to take action against climate change, against species extinctions. But I couldn't get the films that had been made in Africa to be shown in Africa. And that's because they're made for Western audiences and they are bound up in red tape that makes it impossible for those films to be brought back to Africa unless our television channels pay a very hefty price. And none of them are willing to do so. They'd rather show Brazilian soap operas, Indian soap operas than wildlife documentaries. So we had to basically carve our own path and demonstrate that these films are desired. They are watched. In fact, Wildlife Warriors season one was watched by 51% of Kenyans. It's been seen in 26 African countries and is currently running in South Africa and in Kenya. Um, so that's really my story. I want to show you uh, the slide is of my crew. These are three Kenyan, uh, three African crew members. One is Rwandese, two Kenyans. They represent uh, the only wildlife making film crew of African heritage in the entire continent which is shocking when you think of how many wildlife documentaries are made in Africa. And that's largely because Western crews have not been building capacity locally on the ground. And while we have millions of Africans working in the film industry, the combination of film, the technical knowledge, the equipment, the funds, the distribution outlets, uh, and the knowledge of nature, there, there's a, it's, all, it's all broken. We're trying to create something new. And um, uh, could I show the next slide? The next slide shows me with children. So our TV series is not just for the sake of entertaining audiences, which many people do with, with uh, film content. Our TV series is actually for impact. And the impact is on the generation of young people who are the leaders of tomorrow. 
Africa has a very young uh, population. More than 50% of our people are below the age of 18. And that's our target audience, children and young adults. And so we use our television series to create interest in schools. And then we take children out of classrooms into the wild to learn from nature, because we believe that nature is really the best classroom. And the television series is a poor, is a poor uh, reflection maybe of the real nature. And so we try to combine these two things together. For this to work really for us to stem climate change and species extinctions though, we need a transformation in the entire natural history filmmaking industry. And I'm very proud to be working with Disney, with National Geographic on creating this change. Thank you. Yeah, it's really important work you're doing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, and just, uh, you know, I have a parallel, similar story where I did not go to film school. Um, I grew up as a very creative kid. I was a dancer, I played music, but I had a single mom with an eighth grade education who said, there is no way I worked this hard to pull us out of poverty for you to be an artist. You need to get a real job. So I ended up getting my master's. Yeah, people are like, yep, I get it. I had that right, same parent, same parent, right. And so I ended up being the first person to go to college. Um, I had a a desire to see the world. Um, I didn't get on a plane till I was 18. I was very sheltered. And so once I started on that journey, I ended up getting my master's in public health and getting my first job in a war zone. And my mother was like, that's not quite what I envisioned, but okay. Um, and it was there that the power of storytelling became very apparent to me because I was working with women in the Kosovar in the Albania refugee camps for Kosovar women. And we were sitting around at a very high level meeting at the US Embassy and they said, we're very unhappy with the journalists who are coming into the refugee camps. They're coming in saying they only have three days to tell the story and the story they wanted to tell over and over and over again was women being raped as a tool of war. So they would go into the refugee camps and basically say, we need to speak to women who've been raped. Can you raise your hand if you've been raped? And that shocked me. But what they said afterward is what really stuck with me. They said, we fear that at the end of this war, we will no longer be remembered as Kosovar women, but as Kosovar women who've been raped. And so I was already working in the UN NGO space, and that made me reflect and, and analyze all the PSAs, all the documentaries, all the news reports around women in war, women in conflict, and it was perpetuating very harmful narratives. Same was true about Africa. This was in you know the 90s. Um, really harmful narratives, and so it, it sparked an interest in me to change the narrative, to want to use my, my kind of international global health lens and, and tell these stories differently. Not just through film, but through poetry and music and dance or whatnot. And so um, I, pr I launched a whole career being the, the, the UN NGO filmmaker that actually Dr. Paula is talking about. I was traveling extensively on the African continent. And there were three times where I felt ethically, I, I, I didn't know how to resolve the fact that I found my calling, I found my purpose, but am I the right person to be telling these stories? Is a white South African male more, more qualified to tell a story about African women um, and maternal health than I am, who has a master's in public health and who's traveled extensively. You know, power and privilege is, is like a moving target. It's in one space, I, I, I'm in a male-dominated, two male-dominated industries. When I'm in Africa teaching workshops, I'm the privileged one. And so figuring out these ethics, I think, is a really important thing when we talk about um, again, sustainable environments for impact storytellers. How do we resolve the power and privilege dynamics that exist, um, the systems that are at play? And also, um, you know, just for me, I, 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 I'm a big advocate for responsible engagement of artists at the United Nations because that's where I work. And we do not have representation. There's a lot of tokenism that happens with artists. It's like, let's put a poet on stage to perform, but we're not, sit, you know, having a seat at the table to have in, uh, influence in the policies and programs that are being developed for us, especially with this UN International Year. So I think there's a lot that needs to be done, um, and I'm really honored to speak at the World Conference again. I spoke in Bali in 2018, and I think m movement is happening. But um, yeah, I just want to turn it back over to you, Dr. Paula. Is there anything you want to piggyback on that? Yeah, I, I really um, appreciate that your journey, Lisa, has been quite similar um, and, and at the same time in a totally different field. And in a way it, it reflects the need for 
organizations, governments, multi uh, agencies that work across many governments like the United Nations to really recognize and harness this power of storytelling, whether it's through poetry or film, um, in that power to actually change hearts and minds. We are at a time in the history of humanity where more than ever, we need people to understand, we need people to know, but that knowledge, it can't just be for the sake of knowledge, it needs to be for the sake of application. We need people to know that this knowledge is useful for X, Y, Z. And then we need to create those opportunities for that knowledge to be applied, for example, through our outreach. Um, it will require a transformation. And I wonder if um, part of this conversation, if there's a chance for us to pr propose, uh, I'm not sure if it were what kind of an event or body or, or meeting, think tank, to talk about transforming this industry, because you're so right. I've seen it over and over again. And maybe sometimes we see things that we don't have the right words to articulate what we're seeing, that yes, we always put native people on the stage in their, in their traditional clothes as almost like eye candy. I've seen this all over the world and I've seen it, and, and I've, it's always gotten to me and I've never thought about it the way what you just said, is that we're not being genuine. We're not being fair. Those people are not at the table. How do we transform this space? Because it, what it means to me is that uh, most people in the world are not actually participating. And as a result, we'll never get the right answers because most people are not participating. But in addition, something like film and storytelling, you know, these are creative industries that, that um, depend on our imagination. We have so many different ways of telling stories. And those stories and that creative content is worth a lot, right? We're not gonna be able to sell that many more trees or that many more fish or that many more wild animals as meat. Right, but there's there's endless opportunity for our minds to create, and that creation has value. And so maybe for Africa, we should stop thinking about we've got to plant more land, destroy more forests, and plant more vegetation, or do more mining. Maybe we need to unlock the creative opportunities for for the continent of Africa, which is really struggling, and especially now because of COVID. Um, how do we bring that? opportunity of jobs, businesses, uh, entrepreneurship, stories, and, and, and create a flatter earth because we are part of uh, the world's stories, not just an isolated story of Africa. The, the last thing I wanted to mention, Lisa, is that as an African expert who went to Princeton University, I'm sometimes still seen as a, a Kenyan working in Kenya. Yes, I mostly work in Kenya because we have so much that needs to be done in this country. But I would like to see the industry recognizing people like myself as international experts. Um, David Attenborough is great, but we need to have the David Attenboroughs of Africa, of Asia, of South America, of all the islands. We need, we need the world to know that the experts are not only a few individuals who, are, who have been created actually by, by the media. We need to, um, we need to acknowledge and accept um, um, and amplify the voices of other global experts and people with other stories and other versions of science. One of the films I've just recently made is about a forest in Kenya that is protected by indigenous people. David Attenborough has never been there. And I think if he went there, he would be really amazed by this incredible ancient forest protected only by the knowledge of local people. You know, what a wonderful story, never been published it's never it's not in any scientific journal and yet they've done more for conservation than any of these other scientific organizations so how do we bring those stories to light? i think film is going to be the most powerful one of the most powerful tools um, but we need to use that knowledge now to replicate the success of other parts of africa and the world yeah i agree with you and i you know we are in a state of crisis and it was interesting you know Working in this space, I've always hated the phrase, I am the voice of the voiceless. I cannot tell you how many white saviors have used, I am the voice of the voiceless. No, these people, these women, these Africans are not voiceless. They just don't have a platform to be heard. But could we say the same thing about the planet? 
you know, we, she is speaking, she's angry, she's sad, we, we can see it, but we need, in my opinion, all storytellers and all artists on deck to create content so we shift a mass consciousness towards, you know, a sustainable future. And for me, that doesn't mean only, um, you know, more storytellers, more storytellers, more storytellers, but also thinking about sustainable solutions for the creative economy. So for example, I'm a one person crew. I have tripods, cameras, lenses, microphones. Um, I mean, everything. I generate so much e-waste. I jump on planes a lot of times to go shoot my films. My carbon footprint is huge. But if I go to B&H or if I go to some other camera equipment, uh, store, I do not find tripods manufactured from uh, 3D printing or, you know, using, you know, if I work with a graffiti artist, using paint that isn't bad for the environment. We also have to start thinking how to create sust sustainable ways of doing our, our, our storytelling and our artwork, and that's another conversation that we're not having. Like, I would love to talk to a brand or talk to, let's create a sustainable brand for storytellers and artists. Um, and then, you know, we talked a, a little bit about decolonizing arts and storytelling. What does that look like? Uh, we needed, when I started my career, you know, I'm self-taught. And when I would shoot on the African continent, there wasn't a lot of expertise because there wasn't also a lot of equipment. So how can you build, you know, an industry when you don't have the resources, the support, or the training. And so I made it my mission um, to teach every time I did a shoot. So it was sort of my storytelling reparation, so to speak. Um, but we have a lot, we have, we have a long way to go. And I think it really starts with giving people like you and me a seat at the table with policymakers and people who are making decisions about the creative economy. I'm very honored to be on this stage. I was very honored to be on the stage in, in Indonesia. And I think more of this needs to happen because there are creatives like myself who aren't just, again, entertainers, but we're creative thinkers and problem solvers. And we can help create an, a creative economy that is sustainable and, and helpful for the planet. So... Uh, I guess, Dr. Paula, any, uh, we, we have about eight minutes left. Um, anything you want to share? Any new projects? Anything Absolutely. else you want to talk about? Yes, uh, a couple of things. Um, I, when I started making wildlife documentaries and I went out to look for crew, I found that there was nobody who had done this, no local crews. I actually trained my own crew as well, so just like you. And, um, and it was a really amazing experience. Now my crew are the most fanatic conservationists. And that is also another part of the power of storytelling, right? Uh, so, and as I've been growing and thinking, I would, love, I would love my TV series to be filmed in other countries across Africa, but where are those crews? They don't exist. And so I, I launched an effort to, to find out where are the African filmmakers who are in the nature and environmental sector? And um, I organized a meeting, an online Zoom meeting, 670 people signed up. That blew my mind. It blew my mind. How is it possible? There are so many people and they're all in their own little silos, separated from each other, not knowing that actually we, we could be this powerful community. They were not just Africans, they represented BBC, Natural History Unit, the Jackson Wild Film Festival, Wild Screen from Bristol, or National Geographic. All these organizations came on board and they said, we wanna help you to put Africans at the heart of African wildlife filmmaking. That was just, you know, incredible. We now have um, a group of over 250 individuals who are regularly working together. And what I realized when I, I tried to analyze what really is in the way of Africans making wildlife documentaries. Why, if there are so many people interested, why are there no films coming out? And, and also making it to Netflix or any of these massive new platforms. And what I found out is that there's lots of people who are technically trained on cameras. Lots of people may know how to do the sound recordings. Not that many people are good scientists who understand the science and the storytelling of animals and nature. That There's a gap there. But also we haven't really had capacity building around the issue of developing the stories and pitching them to commissioners. Money is the number one problem. And so, you know, really the big gear that needs to shift is the capacity for... Um, developing the story ideas and pitching them successfully, perhaps in collaboration with some of these big organizations. And this is where we've been able to, I think, uh, blaze a path. So Wildlife Direct working with support from uh, USAID uh, have been producing Wildlife Warriors, but also just won a 
a really great um, grant to work with Disney on producing Africa's first wildlife documentary series made by Africans for children. And this series will actually have children as the talent. So can you imagine for the first time in history, the world will see Africa's wildlife through the eyes of our own children. Um, these children will be from as young as seven years old up to about 15 years old. And I think it's going to uh, be very surprising at first, and then it's just gonna become the norm because why on earth not? Why haven't they been at the forefront of the storytelling of, of uh, bringing to life our ancient traditions and our, and our grandparents' knowledge? It's fascinating stuff for anybody in the world. And uh, what a great opportunity for us to celebrate our nature and biodiversity, but at the same time, create a real um, economy around storytelling of our own nature, which will in turn create a reason to protect that nature, to protect those conservation areas and the species that we're telling those stories about. Fantastic. Well, I think we're about to wrap up. So maybe a couple of last thoughts or requests from our audience. Um, I just personally want to say, um, if you are an artist or a storyteller yourself, and you're interested in the work we're doing with Create 2030, I'd love to talk to you. Please come talk to me. And those of you who are not actually practicing creatives, but are engaging more arts and creativity in your programming, I would just strongly encourage you to engage with a creative in the development of any campaign, any program um, because you know th this was the UN International Year of Creative Economy at the same time we had COVID. Artists lost jobs. I lost seven gigs in a matter of days and then there was a perpetual like arts contest. Submit art for COVID-19. Submit art for this for free for free and then there's no industry standards and so basically you're just s creating a culture that is very harmful and dangerous for the creative economy in the sustainable development space. Um, I would also just encourage you to um, not do an arts contest or not do a film festival unless you really think about how this is going to impact the career of the artists that you're doing. Film festivals have distributors, they have press. There's a reason why filmmakers submit their films to film festivals because it's an industry event. If we can create more industry um, level events for creatives where there is an opportunity for their careers to grow, then I think we're being more responsible in how we engage storytellers and artists in this space but would love to talk to anybody here I'm here until um, I'm gonna stay till the 16th I think uh, would love to talk to anybody who's who's watching or, or has interest in this any last words dr. Pollen we're gonna get in touch when I come back to Kenya <laughs> well thank you thank you so much Lisa uh, last word is just that um, I, I'm so sorry that I couldn't make it to Dubai I wish I could have I would love for anybody who's interested in what we're working on, uh, interested in collaborations, interested in being part of our um, network of African filmmakers, either as an African or as anybody from anywhere in the world who wants to help us develop that local capacity and solve these problems, please reach out to me. I'm at wildlifedirect.org, that's our website. And you can email me on paula at wildlifedirect.org. Thank you. Okay. and. My email is lisa at create2030.org, which you can check out our website. Um, and then, like I said, I'll be here. But I, I actually got stuck in Kenya when COVID hit, and I haven't left since. So this was my first flight out of Kenya. And so I'm flying back to Nairobi, which is brilliant, because then Dr. Paul and I are going to have an opportunity, please, to meet in person and, and talk more about this fascinating topic. But thank you to all the organizers of the World Conference on Creative Economy. Thank you to the government of U UAE, to Indonesia, to Colombia, to all the member states that are, are leading this movement. It's necessary. It's important. And I can, I think, speak on behalf of many creatives that I work with. We want to partner with you to create create the most sustainable and, and ethical and responsible engagement and partnership possible. So come talk to us, come talk to me, reach out to us. And um, I, we have one minute left. Any last things that you wanna share? A quote that you love? I love quotes. Any quote, any last thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just so, so, so thrilled about, about this uh, event. Thank you so much, Lisa, and to everyone else. Um, in Africa, we say that you know if you want to go, um, if you want to go it alone, you're not going to go very far. And when you go together with lots of people, that is when you can go the distance. You can go fast as an individual, but you can go far 
when you're together with others. So thank you so much for offering, uh, you know, to, to bring people together so that we can actually combine our forces, um, strategize together, because I do think that we are at a pivotal time for humanity. And uh, what a great opportunity to bring the world together and use our storytelling and our creative imagination to make that difference. I'm really My favorite forward. quote, the role of the artist is to make revolution irresistible. We need a creative revolution to fix the problems in the world. So that's it, time's up. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Thank you, thank you.